I'm all right. I am ready. Good morning. My name is Darnell Melvin, and I'm accompanied today with my colleague Seth Shaw. And we're thrilled to be here today. And thank you for taking time out of your schedule to participate in our presentation entitled Content DM to Islandora 8 Remediation and Migration. In today's presentation, we'll give the 20,000 mile view on our migration efforts, including a historical overview of our digitization activities, our migration flow, our remediation process, and discuss our custom Content DM migration module. During the presentation, feel free to drop any questions that you might have in the chat bar, and you could tweet at us using the tags at metadata guy. And for Seth, at Seth underscore E underscore Shaw. On that note, let me fill you in on our digitization activities at UNLV over the years. Next slide, please. Digitization activities began in early 2000, around 2003, 2004, uh, to post our photo collections online. Um, it was then that Content DM was adopted and descriptive metadata and accompanying websites were created in our cataloging department. In 2006, a librarian was hired in what is now known as library technologies to act as a point person for digital collections and to build the program. Early projects had minimum metadata, was copied over from Mark Fields, and was mapped to Dublin Core. Between 2009 and 2010, activities in the department began to ramp up. The first grant proposals were approved for the project Southern Nevada, the Boomtown Years. And during this period, the first metadata librarian and grant staff was hired to support ongoing projects. Also that year, the thesaurus for graphic materials was adopted to describe the subject matter of those resources. Other notable projects include experimenting with vendors to ramp up digitization production with historical newspapers and increasing access to digital uh, the digitized photo collections and architectural drawings. In 2011, um, the digital collections department was formed and since its formation, it's grown to include five permanent staff out of which three are faculty, one visiting faculty and five student workers. Also that year, the Mountain West Digital Library's metadata application profile version two was released and adopted locally. In addition, subject fast was adopted as the preferred vocabulary for subject headings. In 2014, digitization work focused on community history projects, such as documenting the African American experience grant project. Also, a local linked data study group was formed and early experimentations with linked data be, uh, began. This work led to large scale digitization and preparing for Islandora 8. Um, during this time, new equipment was purchased and experimentations with cross department workflows supporting mass digitization was incorporated into existing technical service workflows. We began minting ARCs for local name URIs, aligned our, our local metadata application profile to the Mountain West Digital Library Map version three, and we started incorporating GeoName URIs in our metadata for geospatial concepts. And the architecture, uh, Getty's uh, architecture uh, thesaurus uh, for genre form concepts. As of December 2019, the repository contained over 2,040, 770 objects, most of which are visual materials. This includes 330 uh, archival photo collections, over 1,000 maps, 1,500 architectural drawings, 2,000 menus, and over 1,300 oral histories and 800 manuscript collections. Now I'll pass it on to Seth to go over our migration flip. For this whole time, we've been in Content DM, um, and we've been preparing only recently to go into uh, our new system, which we selected to be Islandora 8, although it wasn't Islandora 8 yet when we started this whole process. 
Um, but coming from Content DM, we wanted to pull all that descriptive metadata that we'd created over all of these years um, into a form that we could then clean up because we've had just disparate practices over across multiple metadata librarians and standards and whatnot and bring them into conformity with each other. Uh, you'll notice on the bottom left that we are not pulling files from Content DM. We are rather pulling our local master copies because Content DM doesn't have the original master copies. We loaded them in, they created derivatives, but those weren't the same fidelity as our originals that we had. So this is a two-part migration where we're bringing in both descriptive metadata from Content DM and the files that we already locally stored. Um, but we can't just go straight from Content DM into our Islandora 8. Again, we need to remediate some of those older collections that didn't conform to the metadata profile. But also we realized that some of the files that we had locally didn't necessarily match the descriptions that we had um, in Content DM. Some files were missing and we had to do a manual evaluation of what was there and what needed to be fixed. Aside from also determining in some cases where we had a master, but we also had a redacted version so that we wanted to say, here's the original, this should be restricted, and here's the intermediate uh, restricted, uh, or, sorry, redacted version, which is going to be the basis for our service files coming out. Now, once that remediation and inventory work was done by our uh, metadata librarians and digital collections, those would be brought over to the developer, which is myself, to make sure that we can get that metadata into a migration configuration using the Migrate API that we can use uh, to load things into Islandora 8. Now, there were some things that we identified that couldn't be uh, remediated in an efficient manner using scripting that needed uh, probably a lot of student hours to clean up. So we actually did create a separate future cleanup projects list to say, hey, these titles probably need updating. Uh, these probably need more subject terms, but we will have students work on that after we've migrated. So we're remediating what we can, bringing it over, wrapping it up into a migration module that we have, which we first then run on our development server. Um, I'll run it there. I'll say, hey, this is what it looks like or what it would look like if we had loaded into production and let our digital collection staff review it to say, hey, well, we missed that thing. Something didn't come over properly in the migration or perhaps there's something else that this raises that again goes to another future cleanup projects list. That's what those gray arrows are, the feedback loops that we sometimes needed to have. And once we're happy with that migration process, that migration configuration that we have in metadata, then we can copy that migration module to production to actually do the running. Um, so this is the large overview. Darnell's going to talk a little bit more about remediation, and then I'll talk more about our migration module. And that did not advance the slide. So our remediation process is an extract, transform, and load workflow um, that begins with the export of descriptive metadata from Content DM as a CSV. ARCs are then minted for each resource in addition to one for each archival collection. Those URIs are incorporated into our enhanced records. During the realignment phase, legacy collections, each with their own metadata application profile, are normalized to our UNLV map 3.1.1. Local fields are mapped using concepts from Dublin Core, schema.org, and premise. And TGM subject terms have been crosswalked to FAST. Um, it was decided to enhance our legacy descriptions with geospatial metadata. Um, using GeoName Semantic Web Services, 
spatial concepts URIs have been since incorporated into our records. Um, another enhancement includes incorporating URIs from Getty's AAT to represent genre forms. Those terms are then mapped to DC terms medium. So once that occurs, we'll take an itemized list also in the form of a CSV and an itemized list of the subject terms in a CSV and using the known label search query, we could create reports and query it against the LC link data service. Um, what comes back, if there is a label match, we will get the entire record, um, including the authorized preferred label, a URI, and any other links that are also connected into um, the authority record. Um, for the LCSH, we'll use a further, we'll use a process where we'll use a regular expression to peel off the, perf the fast preferred label and its corresponding URI. And that's what we'll use for our subjects. And for the name authority file, it will, we will grab those URIs when we have label matches. Our naming conventions in our metadata um, is, a, is the exact same um, formation and syntax as the LC syntax. Um, once that metadata remediation is complete, then the newly processed records are pretty much ready for that migration module. So the migration module has a few components. Of course, we have the remediated descriptive metadata CSVs in the file inventories that form the basis of the migration. But then we also have a huge pile of migration configurations. Uh, we will, of course, have the standard triplicate pairs, uh, triplicate sets of a node, media, and file migration per remediated collection. So we've done all these collections from content DM that have been pulled out and remediated, and those co come in as groups. The we have a few, and I can show you some examples of those given time and with questions, we'll see where we land with this. But we also had a few custom process plugins. Uh, for example, in content DM, date ranges were expressed by uh, semicolon delimited years. So if we had something with a date range of 1991 to 1993, that would be 1991 semicolon 1992, semicolon 1993. So this is a very simple plugin that simply says, give me the first and last date in that series and slap a slash between them and return it as a single value. So very simple custom process plugin. But we also had a few others that are a bit more complex, such as the name URI lookup and the name URI generate. Um, again, with our early experiments with linked data, we were bringing in both the label and also the URI, but separated by two hyphens. And so we created a plugin that would take this value and break it into those two parts and do a lookup first on the URI. And if that's not there, look up on the label. Well, that wasn't holy enough for just looking up. Sometimes we wanted to create those records uh, if they didn't exist. So the name URI generate basically takes the same thing and adds that additional step of let's create the photographs subject term or uh, material type term, depending on which field it was going into, and then give it the URI so that we can use that for looking up later. Now, once we've brought these all in, one of the things that we came across early on was that Drupal seemed to have a hard time when I was migrating thousands of uh, records at a time with creating the derivatives where they would start throwing errors. It got a little bit grumpy. So we turned off derivative creation uh, during our migrations, which also means they don't get triggered. So we need to trigger them ourselves. So I created just a few local scripts uh, that after the fact, I can say, hey, look for all of our digital collections objects that have an original file, but no service file. And 
go and kick off the derivatives for those objects. Now we do this in four stages. First, the service file from intermediate, because we don't want to inadvertently create a service file from a restricted uh, or, or redact, um, yeah, a restricted original. We want to use the redacted intermediate. So first we run those. Once they're done, we do the rest of them. And then we generate our thumbnails based off of our service files. Uh, that stated, we have a lot of complex objects where the parent record doesn't have its own media. It's a parent record for, say, a uh, postcard where we've digitized both sides and we have two children, one for the recto and one for the verso. But that parent postcard object didn't have its own media. So what we do is we have a script that will simply copy the first child's thumbnail onto the parent record as well so that we can use that for our search and display of collections and groups and whatnot. Um, and so that's what's bundled up into this migration. And one of the reasons why we put this into a single uh, module is that it's all together in one place where we can do updates and revision control all together. But also when we're finally done with this migration from content DM, we can just uninstall this and it's not gonna be sitting inside our system anymore once the whole project is done. Uh, now, again, this was a very uh, large overview of what we're doing. We uh, skimmed over a lot of details, but we are happy to bring up examples, uh, show that what we've done, um, and answer any other questions that you guys might have. No questions so far, but I, I vote in favor of yes, please share your plugins. <laughs> I know at least one of them I've posted on Slack a time or two, uh, but we can probably clean it up and put it in one of the okay. CSV or the Islandora 7X migrate plugins, uh, my, uh, modules, I should say. And you're squishing the drip. Oh no. Uh, and are any of your collections live in Islandora 8? So Francesca, I would love to say that they are. In fact, we had intended for the initial release to be back in December. Uh, but one of the things that we ran into with doing this whole uh, migration was that, you know, when you've lived in an apartment for over a decade <laughs> and then you want to move house and you start packing up your things and you realize you have a lot more junk um, in your apartment than you realize, it's taken a lot longer to box up all of our stuff and move it into the new place. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had a few slowdowns with getting the public user interface, how we wanted it to be. Um, so we're, we're trying to finish up cleaning up the front end interface and bringing over the collection so that we can uh, launch it. We had revised that launch date to be end of June, but then COVID happened, which slowed us down again. So we are trying to get this out as soon as possible. Indeed. Um, but uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, someone asked, is the metadata mapping also available to share? So I can share a few examples right now, but we don't have that in a public repository. Initially it was. But then we started working with restricted materials, and I didn't want to put out configurations and metadata spreadsheets that had references to the restricted materials. So, which is why it's it's not in an open repository. Um, and if you have any, if you ever want to see any of them, I'm happy to share privately so I can pull out things. Uh, but one of the things that we do, you can, instead of listing all your column names, just rely on the column name provided by the, the spreadsheet itself. But we had human readable uh, titles on all of our spreadsheet columns, and I wanted something a bit more machine readable to reference. So we actually do map out every single column in our spreadsheet uh, to something more easily handleable, uh, referenceable by uh, the mapping here. Uh, but there's a number of things in there. 
Uh, what's a good example? We do a lot of exploding on semicolons uh, to pull things apart. We also do, uh, in our content DM, we use the N name to thing resolver for our arcs. Um, but we are pulling those in and using the arc as part of our path. We actually pull that off. Um, there's a number of other things in here. We use a lot of skip on empty because we have a lot of non-required fields that we want to reference. And one of the things with migrate is if you say, hey, map this field to that field and it's empty, it likes to blow up. And so you have to explicitly tell, no, it's okay if I don't have a, a value for this field. And a bunch of migration lookups and other things. It says, how much variation is there between metadata fields across content DM collection? And is there a lot of variation? How do you plan on dealing with that variation in Islandora? So uh, Mark, to answer, to answer that, um, we actually um, re review before the remediation activities happen, we actually review um, the legacy collection and we identify the, um, the kinds of problems that needs to be addressed. And we're about halfway through the remediation as far as our legacy collections. If you look over time in the timeline, like, our, our data model has gotten more complex over time. So the earliest of the collections, the early grants, are the most data compliant. The Once we got down with the Mountain West Digital Library Metadata Application Profile version 2, um, you know, we came into some conformity. The Mountain West Digital Libraries is also like our hub to the DPLA. And so we we really think about metadata from an aggregator's point of view all the way down to local practice. And it was really my job to get everything aligned. So the legacy stuff had more stuff, but they were common, they were common problems. Um, and then the newer stuff had less of it. Um, once stuff was, um, once we got to the era when um, fast terms were used for our subject headings, um the remediation was minimal you know it was more like enhancement activities versus remediation activities um does that address um the question you were getting at 